Happy Friday, everyone. I'm out here for a sunrise battle. A birthday sunrise battle. So we all gotta treat ourselves. I hope everyone's doing well. We are about five weeks in to our quarantine. Students out there, I know this distance learning thing is not the easiest to figure out, so I feel for you. And it's not easy for us teachers either. It's a whole new world to wrap our heads around. Amidst everything that's been going on in our world, there's something nice about being able to watch the seasons change much more closely than I think we normally do. The other day I was just noticing that the, the ducks on my pond are beginning to disappear. The buffleheads and mercancers. And I was a bit sad. Buffleheads are really small ducks. Often when you look out at them on the water, they're in groups. And if you look away for a minute, suddenly only one will be left. Where'd they go? If you wait a minute, they'll pop back up, diving down to the bottom of the pond to find some food. They always leave one guard duck floating around, keeping an eye out on things. Once the other ducks start popping back up, you'll see that one duck on down. So it's a bit sad seeing that they're going to be gone. But as I was thinking how I would miss them, above my head flew some tree swallows who I haven't seen since the fall. So certainly while they'll be a lot of changes in the environment. A lot of those changes are bringing some new things, some new elements to our world. That's exciting. It's certainly new and different, but it is exciting. I think the frustrating thing for a lot of us what makes quarantine difficult is that there's a lot we can't do. A lot of our normal routines are impossible. And it can be easy to get discouraged or let your world close in upon you. But it seems like in those times where the potential for discovery is at its lowest, that in fact is our greatest opportunity. The wardrobe to Narnia wasn't discovered on a normal day. The children had been sent away from their parents. They'd been sent away from their homes. They were afraid of the Blitz, the Germans bombing London. So children were sent to the countryside. It was in that place, strange and confining, that they were able to find the wardrobe and reach new lands. And certainly I don't think most of us are gonna be finding a magic wardrobe. If you do, please let me know. But there is something to the idea that if we look for adventure, if we look at those places we've forgotten about, we might just find something interesting. So I hope everyone's staying curious, that you're staying safe, staying healthy. Students, I miss you greatly. But we'll get through this. It might be a while, but we will. So get out there, go for a walk, look at the new birds that have arrived, and have a great Friday. It's now ready to eat. 
So what's happening in the news? Well, locally in Massachusetts, the state just launched a very cool virus tracking initiative. They're gonna be hiring a thousand workers. Anytime a new infection is reported, those workers will contact the person who has gotten sick, find out who they've been in contact with. All those people will get phone calls as well and inform that they might themselves have been infected and to quarantine. It's the first program like this in the United States. It's been found to be very effective to track the virus elsewhere. So nice job, Massachusetts. Some good news for you sports fans. Dr. Fauci has stated that we might have some sports to come back with no fans, but at least it would give something for us to watch. Certainly around the world, lots of countries are experiencing surges in infections. One piece of concerning news is happening down in Central America, where Guatemala is reporting that migrants that were being deported from the United States have returned testing positive for coronavirus. Another group of people that are a bit worried with this virus are women who are pregnant. Luckily, I have a good friend who can talk to us a bit about both what's going on in Guatemala, as well as telemedicine, and not just for pregnant women, but really anyone that's looking for some advice from a medical professional. So I thought I'd check in with my dear friend Alyssa, who is a nurse practitioner and a midwife who works at a birth clinic in Kodiak, Alaska. Though she's not there right now. So let's check in on her. When it comes to prenatal care, what are you talking people through? The midwifery model of care goes into pregnancy and birth as a physiologic process and sort of everything is fine unless we have indicators that it's not fine, you know? Healthy people without pre-existing disease, without with out conditions in their lives that make things harder for them, have normal, healthy pregnancies. So it's one of those things where it's like, if you are having a conversation with a patient and they say something that kind of tips your scale of, hmm, I would like to you know, go down that pathway a little bit more and get more information about that detail that you just provided me, it would be wonderful to be able to do that in person. But um, a lot of the stuff that we do uh, as midwives is having that conversation and just sort of reassuring patients that, yeah, everything is going great. You know, everything you're telling me is totally normal. These are some tips and tricks to be more comfortable in your pregnancy, but just as we thought through our, you know, midwifery perspective, your pregnancy is going well and everything sounds perfect and we don't need to do extra tests. We don't, you know, they, they're always available, but we don't need to do extra tests, extra exams, all this extra checking up on things because they sound, they sound normal and progressing the way they should. Like, do you think maybe with, people saying like, I am pregnant, I am not going into a hospital, like this form of care might catch on more so than it might have in normal times? Yes, I absolutely think so. Um, and there have been a number of New York, uh, New York Times articles written uh, about kind of the overwhelm that home birth midwives in New York City are, are suffering right now. People call, you know, last minute, I'm due next week, can you take me on as a client? But there was an opinion piece um, written by someone in the New York Times staff who was pregnant. It was just interesting to read because it was so clear that it never occurred to her that there were these options to have your baby outside of the hospital. Okay, so now I have to consider how safe the hospital actually is, which, like you know, all in my along. opinion, I was going to say has always been the case because, yeah. like, that's where sick people go, <laughs> yeah. and if you're pregnant that doesn't mean you're sick. Um, so now she's kind of like reevaluating and I'm like this very educated woman who is a professional writer 
it never even dawned on her to think about she has options of where she can have this baby and there are safe options. You are kind of forced <clears throat> into practicing telemedicine um, because you are not in Alaska right now where the, your business is. You are where? Yes. Starting from the beginning. Um, so I am currently in Quetzaltenango in the mountainous highlands of uh, the country of Guatemala. I started working here a little more than a year ago with a birth center. Um, I had a contract for uh, just about a year, a little bit, uh, a little bit longer than a year working with the birth center. And my contract, I was in the last week of my contract when um, all of this started happening. So uh, you know, as things systematically got shut down here, you know, I couldn't take tr public transportation to the birth center that I had moved out of at that time. Um, and then, you know, I couldn't go from department to department, which departments are like states um, in the US. So, you know, then that travel was restricted. And then my flight got canceled and then they shut the airport. Um, my opportunities to get back were limited and they were limited in two ways where the u.s embassy um made a lottery for i think they had like three flights in total for all of the people in uh, guatemala who are u.s citizens trying to get back so i didn't win that lottery um <laughs> oh. which part of me is sort of like okay um that makes me a little happy because I'm sure there were people here like on vacation or people here yeah. that hadn't been here that long where we're like, holy crap, get me out of this foreign country. Um, and, you know, I'd been here a little bit more than a year, so I uh, at least am a little accustomed to what it's like to live here um, and was set up in that way. And um, so I didn't win that lottery. And then, of course, um, I had a lot of people from the U.S. putting some of their anxieties on me about how dangerous it is for me to be here. And they were like, okay, so I researched that people are um, hitchhiking to the Mexican border and then you can walk across the Mexican border still. And then you just have to figure out how to get to Mexico City from the border. And then you can take this flight and this flight will connect here. And so I sort of did an assessment of it would be higher risk of me spreading and contributing to the spread of this virus that if I did all of those crazy things that people were doing to get back to the US. Um, and obviously, if I get sick and needed to go to the hospital and it, it, and the disease got really serious for me. I, I The infrastructure here is a little bit weaker, but the risk of me doing that if I just sat tight is much lower than yeah. me contributing to the spread of the actual disease if I did all of those crazy pathways. Um, so I also wholeheartedly dislike Mexico City. So. <laughs> I really didn't want to go there. Um, since then, there's been some back and forth of like, okay, the airport is open, but it was only open for a couple days. And if you didn't book one of the exact flights that got out, um, then your flight got canceled, which was the case for me. And then the Guatemalan government closed the airports again, but didn't tell anybody, just canceled all the flights. Um, so now I've got another flight uh, for the beginning of May to go back to the US, but we'll see if that actually happens because, um, you know, it hasn't been that important for the Guatemalan government to say, okay, this is an announcement, tomorrow we're closing the airport. And they just, they just do it. So we'll see. So if you can't travel between the departments, <laughs> like, are they enforcing that with some severity? Yeah, they are. They are. They actually have checkpoints. And around here, even if you're going from town to town, they have checkpoints. They, wow. you know, want to know where you're going. They want to know, because we also have a curfew um, where everyone has to be in their house by 4 p.m. So like even like walking a dog? Can't. Whoa. You can't be out of your house. Like in your yard? If, you, if, if you're in your yard, not in you know contact with the street okay yeah. wow you see a lot you see a lot of people with like their front doors open just like hanging out yeah 
it's like really common for people to have um like a terrace on their roof oh yeah and a lot of people keep their dogs up there so you know at about four o'clock every day you go up there and you can see all the dogs <laughs> there's people up there sometimes that's kind of nice i i yeah i a rooftop terrace is like a a, a pretty great thing to have during a quarantine yes Oh. Yes, I completely agree. Thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> what would be some foods right now that you're eating? I'm at like 8,000 feet. So bread like doesn't really rise that well there? No, you got to change the recipes to add um, more yeast. Like I actually had been putting yeast in my cupcakes. Like that's how it like, because if you don't, they just come out like those little like um like flourless tort like super dense you know so you got to change the recipe for like everything all right well it was awesome chatting with you thanks talk to you soon yes so the cdc is recommending that if you're going out into a public space especially a spot where it's hard to maintain social distancing that you should wear a face mask so we have a great demo for you from fashion design extraordinaire Ms. Butterfield showing you how you can make your own face mask at home. Let's check it out. What are you looking at? Hi everybody, Ms. Butterfield here. I wanted to talk to you about face masks. There are a million tutorials online right now to show you how to make face masks out of different materials and in ways that different hospitals would like them to be made. Um, if you would like to make a bunch of masks to donate to a medical facility, you're best to get in contact with that facility itself and find out what type of mask they're asking for. Most facilities have tutorials associated with the types that they want that they can show you. This tutorial here is more about making ones for yourselves. All you need for this mask is material, scissors, a sewing machine if you have it, and if not, a needle and thread, and two hair elastics. Put those together, and voila. Once you've cut two pieces, one 13 inches by 7 inches and one 9 inches by 7 inches, you're going to take the smaller one that's only 9 inches wide and place it directly in the middle of the one that's 13 inches. You're going to have a couple inches on each side of it sticking out. You want to have the wrong side of your top fabric facing the right side of your bottom fabric. This is going to make sure that when we make the mask, there's a definitive right and wrong side to the mask so you never screw it up and put a side that you've already faced out onto your face. Once you've put these together, you're going to sew along this edge here and along this edge here. You can do that either with a sewing machine at 5 eighths or you can do it with a hand needle with a running stitch right along this edge. Once you've turned it inside out on the ironing board, you're going to iron the sides so they lay flat and this little fold over here, which is your seam allowance from those two seams that you created, is going to fold over and you use your iron to kind of press it and keep it in place. If you look, you'll see you have a little flap here and a little flap here, two little flaps here. They're folded in and you use the iron. Hit it with a little bit of steam and that will force those flaps to stay where they are. Okay. The next thing you want to do is from this edge, only about a quarter inch, you're going to use the iron again 
watch your fingers. You're gonna fold a little quarter inch fold in there. And do the same thing on this side. Again, just a little quarter inch and watch your fingers. Use the steam button on the iron on high heat if you're using cotton, on the lower heat if you're using anything that is not made of natural fibers. Okay, once you do that, fold that in so it's overlapping a little bit right there where this edge here, like that. Essentially, you're making kind of a tube because what we're gonna do is we're gonna sew right along this edge and that's gonna create a little tube for us to put our elastic. But we're not quite there yet. Use your iron, fold the other side, use the heat, the steam function, and we'll make sure everything stays in place. Okay, this is where you're gonna need to enlist somebody else's help. Have your assistant take their hands and Hold your hair elastic wide and as far apart as they can. You're going to take this little flap that we made with the iron and fold it right over one edge of that hair elastic. With your needle and thread, without poking your assistant, while they hold it for you, you're going to sew through all of those layers of fabric to close that tube. Now, you don't want to have really big stitches, but you don't need to have super tiny ones either. It doesn't need to look amazing. It just needs to work. Once you get down to the end, you're going to tie a knot to end your stitch. Hold this in one hand, bring your needle, oh, <laughs> don't poke your assistant, around, under, and walk that all the way down. Put your finger on it and pull. Do that a few times so that you know you're not, stays in place. Okay, once you've got that, snip and ask your assistant to let go. Ta-da! You're gonna do the same thing to the other side. This is what your mask should look like when you've sewn up both sides. You can wear this as it is, but if you want to make it fit a little bit better, you can right in the middle, give it a little pinch, take a pin, pin it right there, and do the same thing at the bottom. Find the center, give it a little pinch, and pin it. You're gonna sew two little triangles in sewing, it's what we call darts, and it will make it seal a little bit around more around your nose and around your chin. Okay, those little triangles we just sewed, you're gonna iron those nice and flat. So kind of pull them out as best as you can, take the tip of your iron and press them down to one side. What that will do is train the fabric to kind of get out of your way. Remember, watch your fingers. So that there, that's one complete. You have one other option. If you don't want to use the hair elastics, which you can do, is fold those edges over like I was showing you and just sew straight along each side without any kind of elastic. You've essentially created a nice tube for yourself. You're gonna then take a shoelace and wiggle it through. Inchworm it. And a crumpling and pulling your way through the tube. So you come out the other side. Like that. Ta -da. And you're gonna do that to the other side as well. The nice things about the masks you just made is there's a very noticeable right side, which is the nice side of the fabric, the side you want everybody to see, you should always wear that facing out. And there's a very visible wrong side of the fabric, which is kind of the lighter, 
not as good side of the fabric. That's the side that you always want facing towards your skin. And they're relatively easy and should be able to fit everybody in the family. For the one with the shoelaces, I also did a little dart, that little triangle, fold it in half, so two little triangles like that, open it up, iron them, press them over. You can then take the two strands together on each side, put it over your face, and tie them in a nice bow behind your head. You should be all set to go. Strike the pose. Thank you. Last weekend was Easter, celebrated by Christians around the world. And certainly it's a bit different than Easter has been celebrated ever in the past. So to hear about how the church is coping, I checked in with my friend Matt Wooters, who is a Jesuit brother in Berkeley, California. Hey, Mr. Shea. Yeah, the old brother Matt. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. Welcome to the Mr. Shea Show. So I live in Berkeley, California. I live with 12 guys right now, and we're all studying. So we're in grad school, which is also online, kind of like your students. So we are experiencing the frustrations and struggle of Zoom and all the, all the ways of online learning is hard. Um, but what's interesting is I'm also with 12 people. So despite being in isolation, I also have people around all the time which is good and bad. Uh, if any of your students are quarantined with a big family, they know that feeling <laughs> of being, being ignored by people, but also enjoying their company. Do you find that like, it seems like something that is really in our wheelhouse of, okay, yep, this is, these are the steps that I'm gonna need to take to have a healthy life right now. Definitely, and I, I was thinking about that, how our time, so Mr. Shea and I live together in Belize uh, in a community and uh, yeah, there's certain things that like you learn that like, okay, if someone's driving me crazy, it probably has less to do with them and more to do with me, and I need to maybe go for a run. And so, uh, yeah, after 10 years, you kind of get used to some of those rhythms. The, the things that used to annoy me a lot annoy me less. New things annoy me, but uh, I think there's a certain uh, generosity after so many years in community. Uh, we kind of take care of each other. Living in community is always a challenge, um, mm -hmm. but with 12 people in a more urban setting. Are you finding that even your experience with uh, living in a community has been a bit strained or at least adapting to, to fit new changes and routines? I think so. Um, we're all just around more because we would all have a job that we would go do and then come home and talk about it. Well, now, like when you ask, how was your day? It's like you were sitting like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, so that's changed a little bit. I think for me, it's been, I've been trying to be really intentional about not talking about the news because we're all consuming it either actively or passively. And for some people, they really need and want to talk about it. Uh, for I, I would prefer not to talk about it, kind of using this opportunity to get to know them better. And so that's been kind of cool is having better conversations rather than maybe keeping it surface level. So that's been that's been great. And also just caring for each other. We 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 cook for each other more because we're we're all here every day. So in the past, we would have maybe weekends would be kind of free, do whatever you want, but there's no restaurants to go to. So it's like we all eat dinner here every night. And so the, it's a little bit more focused on each other. How do you feel about your cooking skills right now? Very subpar. Uh, <laughs> I would say I'm a very functional cook. I made a nice Easter brunch. So on Easter, we had a, we had mass and we had church in the morning. And then we had a, kind of like a nice breakfast lunch situation. And so I was proud of that. I made a bacon and sausage and cinnamon rolls and kind of like egg bakes and the guys seem to enjoy that like you just you threw in cinnamon rolls in there i thought you just kind of say eggs and sausage like cinnamon rolls is a is an impressive addition right there uh the the pillsbury kind of the tube not like the kneading your dough <laughs> hey the I, I i'd say anything that you're gonna bake is is a is a job well done <laughs> I, I, I mean, mentioning the going to church. So it's unprecedented. So we've never had a time where no one can go to church before, at least in our lives. So it's really, creativity is really needed right now, but also respecting that like science is real and this is unsafe for us to meet. So 
you're you're seeing on the news, you know, pastors kind of defying things and God will protect us. And that's really unsafe and really unhealthy. And so we are very much of the line of um, to care for each other and to love each other and to be church is actually to not go out. And so rather than viewing it as like, I can't do all these things, I've actually taken care of the old people who live near me and, um, and old people on my street by not going out. And so changing that outlook has been really important. And then also creative ways of reaching out to people. So uh, for my family, we did kind of like a little Zoom Easter. Uh, it wasn't the same as church, but we were all together and we all prayed together and we shared what, what, what's on our mind. And uh, we each lit a candle in our own space on Zoom, but kind of like a unity thing. And so finding creative ways to be church with each other when you can't go and do it. Um, I actually think it's exciting because it, it, it shakes things up and it makes us more what's important to us and how do we do more of that. Especially in the lead up to Easter is interesting. Like a lot of people were being more vocal about, you know, how they were uh, joining services and different things with prayer. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like in many ways, it's the most vocal people have been about how they are expressing their faith than I've seen in, in the past. For sure. And, and people have a lot more say now, because if, if you're watching mass on Zoom, you can comment if the priest says something good or bad. And so you actually have a lot more say rather than just being talked at. So despite it being kind of um, from a distance and watching on your computer, there's still a lot of, of tie-in. So, um, you know, traditionally at church, you wouldn't have a chance to, to mention people you want to pray for, but now you can comment it on Facebook Live or whatever. Which, which I imagine, like, if I was giving a, a homily and someone's like, uh, this is lame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So, but sometimes the priests need to hear that if they're being bored. Yeah, right. So. <laughs> so, like, there's like a bunch of random letters that have been like being sent, and they're like, oh, they must have fallen asleep on their keyboard. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to give advice to people looking at that intentionality of reflection, what would you say to folks that have never done it and maybe are willing to try right now? Yeah, well, I'd say you're already doing it. Everyone already does it. It's just a matter of like making a little bit more formalized. Numbers can be helpful. So uh, the way I would teach, I taught at a primary school. And so what I, the way I would teach the little kids is you just use numbers. So what is five things you're grateful for? And so have them go through five things. What is two things that didn't maybe didn't go so, or were disappointing today? That's okay too. And like, so five, five ups, maybe two downs. And then one hope for looking for the future. That future could be in an hour. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. It could be when the pandemic's over. But I, I, I find the, the numbers can be helpful because then you actually have to answer them. And so don't just say like my family. Well, why, why today? Why specifically was your family? A, why are you grateful for your, for your family right this second? Or why is your family annoying you? Just don't write your family as an annoyance. Oh, today was super annoying because I couldn't find my alone time. Okay, well, that's really helpful. Like that's really helpful information. And so... I find that helpful. Maybe other people would find that helpful too. I, I noticed you have a, a, a great photo of Miss Cat T behind you. Yeah, our friend. Um, so this is um, a blue woman that was friends with Mr. Shea and I, and uh, I don't know how to make this. Oh photo. yeah, there we go. Uh, so I secretly took this photo because she doesn't like her photo being taken. <laughs> no. And so she was smiling at the neighbor and it's like, I think it's, one of the nicest pictures I've ever taken. It's like, as a photography teacher, I would definitely give you a, a very good grade on that one. Yeah, like the light and the dark, and I just adore her so much. And this is her essence to me, and yeah. Yeah, it's she has just such a, a kind and like gentle and happy face, but also like a bit mischievous because we totally, which is very much her, right? And yeah, she would definitely be. She's probably making fun of the person who's outside too for you know being late or something like. <laughs> Like, definitely has given them a nickname that may or may not be <laughs> flattering. That's right. That's right. Well, you're a great nicknamer. I do like giving nicknames. It's, for me, it's a sign of affection. It's like, it's like if I get to know you, and then I notice weird quirks about you, and then I will highlight them, not to, not to shame anyone, but to like, oh, I know you. Like, so I'm going to call you this thing. Yeah. Well, Mr. Shea, it's been so lovely to talk with you. Heck yeah. It has been a pleasure and a joy. And happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Fairly well. I am happy to report some very good news. The Mr. Shea Show has picked up the first sponsorship from Naps. Have you found yourself feeling tired? Perhaps you're even feeling a bit groggy. Or maybe, just maybe, you're flat out bored. Well, allow me to introduce you to this brand new lifestyle change that you can implement today.
combination of yoga, meditation, mixed martial arts, and most importantly, sleeping. This new and patented lifestyle is providing Americans like you with endless types of opportunities and benefits. Benefits like eating an onion. Learning to pogo stick. Watching your favorite documentaries. And even exercising. Don't forget those fun-loving bubbles. So, if you've ever felt sleepy, tired, maybe even a little bit groggy, then try napping today. It could be for you. I know a lot of you are getting outside, walking, riding bikes. What happens if one of your bikes has a flat tire? Good question. Good thing we had Andrew send in a video of how to change a bike tire. Everyone that is doing some art right now, sometimes I think it's hard to think about how you are going to create a piece. So we have our friend Mr. Miguel, who has put together a demo of how he approaches creating a piece of art. Let's check it out. Hi, welcome to my painting demo. My name is Philippe Miguel. I'm an artist living in Southeastern Mass. I teach fine arts classes at Barnstable High School. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to sort of walk you through the process, my process of building uh, a painting. And uh, this painting is uh, fairly abstract, um, but what I'd like to do today, and hopefully with this video, is uh, demonstrate um, some of the ways that I make decisions uh, based on uh, shape, color, line, and those kinds of elements that we see in art. All right, so what we're looking at right now is me painting over one of my older works that's been in storage in my studio. Speeding things up, I'm drawing into the paint surface. I'm working with this motif of the like from Facebook and from Instagram. I use a variety of paints, acrylics, house paint, spray paint, as well as markers and other media for my paintings. So some of the drips that you see are intentional. Uh, I want that expressive look in my painting. And you also can see that I added these wooden strips at the bottom and at the top corners in order for the canvas to stay still while I add three-dimensional elements. Okay, so now I'm starting to paint some of the shapes in. Um, the red usually takes 
uh, quite a few layers to get it to that uh, brightness that I'm looking for. And I also added this kind of yarn, this sort of peachy yarn um, to the top of the canvas. And you'll see that I'll use that yarn um, in a strategic way for my composition as the painting progresses. What I'm doing now is I'm thinking about how color will move your eyes around the canvas. I go through a lot of edits in a painting like this. Just as easily as I'm wiping out large areas with white paint, I'm gonna come back and rework some darks. I guess my composition would be considered all over. Um, it's a term that, that was used for paintings that didn't quite have one focal point. Um, artists like Cy Twombly were known for that, or maybe even um, abstract expressionists like, you know, de Kooning or Pollock. Historically, abstract expressionism has a reputation of being macho and it was dominated mostly by men and underrepresented by women and minorities. So my paintings have the same types of marks and brush strokes that you might recognize from abstract painting of the past or expressionistic painting or pop art painting. Um, all that language is built up from uh, seeing a lot of artwork um, to get out there and sort of um, see uh, what other artists are doing. And, you know, through that, um, you start to become more comfortable with the language of mark making. Um, and what I'd like to do with that uh, knowledge is to be sensitive to the times that we're living in today. And hopefully I'm doing that minus all the machismo. See that I'm painting the sides of the canvas. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because I treat the canvas like uh, an art object rather than, say, a picture that needs to be framed. Um, the painting will, will sit without a frame. Um, it'll be framed by the bits and pieces of yarn that you see at the top and or around the sides, as well as... I'll carry the, the same shapes and colors around and wrap the, uh, the canvas. So I posted the, the painting on Instagram uh, with a time-lapse video of the final stages and I asked uh, people what they thought would be a good title for the work. Um, and these are some of the titles that uh, people shared. Um, love. Um, I like pink. Um, another one was Interaction. And another title was Love in the Time of Corona. Reborn, Rebirth, Social Distance, Dissonance. Or It Oozes Love in a Desperate Way. And I think all of them are excellent, um, you know, choices or reactions to the piece. And as an artist, you know, the thing that you really love more than anything is that people do have a reaction to it. And I think that what I wanted to do with the work was to do some kind of uh, piece that related to how broken our relationships are. And it's fitting that we are where we are. Ever have a bunch of bananas that you don't think you're going to eat, then they start turning brown? If so, keep watching. If not, well, you might. <laughs> brown bananas, don't throw them away. These are awesome. These are fantastic. And in fact, many ways, bananas that look like they've gone past ripe are actually the best. The good thing about overripe bananas, even though they're starting to get squishy, they start smelling really banana-y. So if you really want some good banana flavor, don't use like green or just barely yellow bananas. You want to start getting darker ones. And if you don't 
want to make anything banana-y at the moment, perfect. I don't either. So what I'm going to do with these bananas here, I'm just going to throw it in my freezer. All right, so it's been a few weeks. How many? I have no idea. But those bananas that were in the freezer now look like this. So these bananas are pretty hard. I'm going to let them thaw out, and then we'll make some banana bread. It's been about an hour and a half. The bananas are now fairly squishy. So I'll just slice those open, and the pulp can come right out. For this recipe, other than the bananas, you're also going to need flour, sugar, oil. I'm using coconut oil for this because I like the flavor. The coconut and the banana mixes nicely together. If you're using coconut oil, it's solid. Uh, so you're going to need to heat it up so that it does become a liquid. You don't want to throw solid coconut oil in there. You can use any oil you have, vegetable oil, canola oil, whatever you get, it'll work. Baking powder, salt, if you have it, chocolate chips. These are some nice 85% cacao dark chocolate, semi-sweet. If you don't have chocolate chips, you don't need to put it in there. However, they do make banana bread taste really nice. As long as you have all those ingredients in a bowl, in an oven, you're good to go. You're just gonna mix them all up in one bowl. I'm gonna set the oven at 350 degrees. I'm gonna grease that pan so that the bread doesn't stick to it. Pop it in for about 20 to 30 minutes. And we're done. We're good to go. We're going to eat some bread. So let's mix some things up and uh, get kicking. Oven is preheated, so I'm going to throw it in, and then in about 20 minutes or so, it should be done. So I'll check it with a toothpick and make sure, but we're going to throw it in. Middle rack's fine. It's been about 20 minutes or so, so I am going to check the spread. All right, so you gotta use the toothpick method. Since there's chocolate chips in there, if you hit a chocolate chip, obviously that's going to be wet. So uh, if you hit a chocolate chip, find a different spot. Toothpick went in. <laughs> I didn't purposely pick a chocolate chip to start the <laughs> But the toothpick is clean, which means we're good to go. And I'm just gonna let it sit in the pan, though, for about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes before I cut into it. You don't wanna cut into anything when it's super hot. Uh, you wanna let whatever you're cooking settle a bit. So yeah, we'll wait a little bit, cut into it, and see how it tastes. So right after I stopped recording last time, uh, I did another test with the toothpick, and it was very much not done. So I ended up putting it in for another like 20 minutes because I was going off of muffin times, which 20 to 30 minutes would have been great for a muffin, whereas bread's much denser uh, and larger to cook, thus it takes longer time. So about 50 minutes, 55 minutes it took. The bread is much darker, which is really where you want to be. Bread's cooled down. It's now ready to eat. See how it looks here. All right, we get some banana bread. And that's it. Super easy, super tasty. Mmm, that's so good. Make some banana bread. If not, I guess find someone else who could make banana bread for you. <laughs> All right, thanks, y'all.